Hello everybody, I am Dan, and I am joined by Maka. Hello again. Hello, it's been a week and a bit since we last spoke. Yeah, like a, what, a week imagine. and a half? Week and a half. Uh, then we were kind of overwhelmed by the an sudden announcement that Future Redeemed would come out a week later. Mm -hmm. uh, and here we are a week and three days later, and we both finished it. Yeah, yeah, I beat it up. I, I, yeah. I beat it up. I beat it last night, um, and I've just kind of been... It's been like a little over 12 hours or something, uh, and I've just kind of been uh -huh. thinking about it almost nonstop since I woke up. For, for me, it's, it's about... When did I finish it? About... It's been a bit more than 24 hours. I did it roughly in about two days. Mm -hmm. With the second day basically going until I uh, couldn't go anymore. Uh, which, you know, was a choice of mine. Uh, at the end of the day, I I will say regardless of that, I was really enthralled by everything. So I wanted to keep going. So that was not really like an argument. Like, I wanted to see what would happen at the end. And... We will get into that a little bit, but I will say I am not disappointed at all, not even in the slightest. I was very happy with what they showed us. No, I absolutely agree. I basically loved everything in here. I think my only my only real issue with the narrative is that there are points where the pacing was really fast, but like I yeah, I loved it at like Hmm. so much that I've played so I've played every game in the grander like Xeno series and yes. as a Xeno Blade fan I was very satisfied uh -huh. as a Xeno fan I, there were multiple moments where I was freaking out and yelling <laughs> I, I had about the same I would say most of my screaming because usually and people who've been following me for a while longer know like I am usually like on gasping, but I'm really reserved in that. Like I, I don't freak out over stuff like usually. But I would say that the start of the final chapter, so chapter five, until the very end, I was constantly freaking out, and that is very unusual for me. The and same. I think the last time I had that was unsurprisingly enough, Torna. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. It. Chapter five is so it, it, it's so awesome having played like every game in this series and then seeing how everything just culminated and came together in, in so many ways even though this is still like a prequel one thing i will say is yes. i'm really glad that it's a prequel but it doesn't like it doesn't feel like it lessens or invalidates the stuff that happens in the base game no absolutely not not even the slightest no. absolutely not that was a that was a fear I had was uh, well if this is going to be like the big like the conclusion, is it going to make the base story feel like oh this is like this weird afterthought? And it's like no no absolutely not. It, it still very much feels like everything culminated, everything culminated here. But there's still some things in ba that needed to be fixed up, and base three basically covered all of that. I I do think that base three left us with more, in some cases, more questions than answers mm -hmm. in some grand schemes. I do feel like Future Redeemed get, did a good job, like, leviating those concerns we had before, plus the stuff that wasn't really elaborated on uh, come the end of free. Mm -hmm. I, I do feel like... I, I mean, there's one reservation that I have, is that they didn't really... Mm, I didn't feel like they touched enough on Glimmer and Nicole. I will as agree with much that. As I probably would have. They yeah. they felt like in the beginning they were really important, but come around like yeah. the halfway point, it felt like they just kind of fell off. And they would get moments, but for the most part, it, there were just points where it's like uh, they don't. They're kind of just here. Yeah, yeah. To me, like when we entered. And there were some smaller scenes where you could still see the interaction between Nicole, Glimmer, and uh, Shulk and Rex. Mm -hmm. But they didn't play as much out as I thought they would. And is it a big loss in the grand scheme of things? No. Would I have loved to see it? Honestly, I do. Because they do hint on a stronger connection. 
but they really never really went into it. Not really, no. No. And I, th I think that's, to me, like, only, like, the major shame. Where, where it comes back to your point, right? Where they rushed over a few things in terms of story. But, like, the big notes, the big cliff notes that, and the big takeaways that people l will like from this DLC are so strong that I am sort of willing to overlook that in some ways. Mm -hmm. I agree, I agree. Uh the... Honestly, the main pacing... Overall, I would say, from beginning to end, the pacing is a little fast, but I was able to excuse that because it's like, you know, it, it, it's a DLC. They have a lot they need to pack in there. Mm. Um, but there's really only two moments in which I feel like the pacing could have really slowed down. That was around the halfway uh -huh. point. And then there's like, towards the end, there's a bit where it's like, they could have slowed this down a bit, but it didn't... It didn't feel overwhelming in the same way that that other part in the at the halfway point felt hmm but, but let's look into the grander picture right so let's go over what we thought of the characters really quick because we're already going deeply into story um we have some context here but not everywhere and if you're listening to this you obviously are interested in what we think of it so it's not that big of a deal mm -hmm. um but it's good to discuss the characters i honestly felt that, like, to me, I adored Matthew for how silly he was. He was so and goofy. Here's the, it's so goofy. Because in some ways, like, let's be real here. Like, Xenoblade 3, in for all intents and purposes, was a pretty serious game. Mm -hmm. I would Two say it's probably the darkest more, of the trilogy. Yeah, yeah. Two had more alleviation. I think Torna toned that down a little bit, but for... A reasonable amount. I mean, still, like, some of the main characters are still goofy. But not to the extent that Mafia really is. No. Um, and I think I appreciated a ton, like, his endless optimism. Even when he's faced with, like, very dire circumstances, he seems to see the brightest in all of it. And I, for one, like, really appreciated that. I agree. I agree. I, I really enjoyed his optimism. Um, he... It's it's so he's so interesting to me because I'm someone who I like Rex, but I am not as hot on him as other people are, and that is I am not as hot on him either. So we we agree. Okay, so. good. I have been uh uh I've heard a lot of stuff from people because of that opinion. Um, but like I I like Rex. I like him in two. But part mm. of it is there are points where I feel like that optimism just gets a little too much for me. Um, Matthew felt like a much better balance personally yes um where he's optimistic but it never got to the point of being annoying um and i'm not fully sure that's i'm not fully sure why I, that's something i would probably need to like really sit on and like think about but i did not i, I did not find him annoying basically at all um i no. found him really goofy <laughs> he was so goofy uh all oh, his yeah. quotes like like let's go have a shoofty guys and stuff um Part of it, though, is also, like, I've never heard some of the things he said, like, shufti and feeling full of beans. Like, mm. I've never heard that. So, to me, like, I now know that those are things said in the UK, but in the moment, it just kind of adds to his character and makes him so, like, what is this weirdo? Mm -hmm. What is this weirdo? He's I mean, just... even with knowing some of the context of the sentence he says... His unbridled optimism, like, makes those sentences work so well. Mm -hmm. um, like, once again, he has a serious edge to it, like, for sure, when it comes to the more dire moments of this DLC. But in general, he's just, like, a very likable character. I agree. I agree. I'm seeing a lot of people uh, like him even more than Noah. Uh, I don't agree with that, but I fully understand why. I fully understand oh. why. I 100% I get it. Like, 100%. Um, I think, to me, the most interesting character in this DLC, despite despite being Matthew such a major part of it, I think A is honestly the most intriguing character of, of the, the entire party. Oh, I totally agree. A is fascinating. Literally from moment one, I was like, what is their deal? Why do they have... Why do they have the Antos core crystal on their ear? Why, why do they look like... A female Alvis, like it, it was 
moment one, I was fascinated, especially because the game opens and they're just kind of there. They don't explain it. They're just yeah. there. And then eventually it's like, oh, that's that's their deal. That's why that all of this makes so much sense now. Hmm. I feel like we got that answer quicker than I was expecting either. Like, as soon as Rex and Shul come to the picture, like, it immediately shifts and immediately ex expand upon, like, within, like, the next hour in, like, the literally the next cutscene. Obviously, there's some gameplay between there. Um, but it feels like it gets elaborated on, like, really quickly. That and was... you get more details. Yeah, you get more details as you go along and you get a fuller picture. But, like, the immediate, um, the immediate reveal of what, like, A actually is... Um, like, like it starts from there and like escalates further as you inch closer to the end. I, I, yeah, that, so the scene, the scene I was talking about where I felt like the pacing was too fast was the A reveal scene. Cause it was just, mm. it was just Shulk, Rex and A all gathering up and they're just talking and they're all talking about stuff that they know, but yeah, we don't know. And they're talking about all of this so fast, and it felt like probably the intention was to make you feel like, whoa, 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 wait, what's going on here? I'm so confused. But in the moment, it was just like, it took me out of it. I was just like, what, what is happening here? A is hmm. Alvis, Alvis is Alpha, all this stuff is happening, and it, it, it was, in the moment, it didn't really <laughs> feel satisfying, it yeah. just felt confusing. Um, but as it and went on, I better understood everything. Yeah. And then immediately afterwards, like, almost on on point, Alpha drops into the frame of the cutscene. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I agree with you. That cutscene did feel like it went a little bit too fast. I didn't have as much of an issue with it, though, because I had the intended erection which you are describing. I, I was like, wait, hey, what? Huh? Huh? And then it... it it felt perfect to me, like absolutely perfect. But I also see your side where you have more of a distance and are more confused about the whole thing, where you weren't expecting it to be dropped like relatively that soon into the DLC. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Now, that was something I was expecting to see towards probably like the 75% mark. Um, mm. Though, honestly, uh, that bit towards the end I was talking about where the pacing also felt fast. I feel like that's more akin to what I would have wanted the pacing of that scene to be. Where it's like, there are things there, but it never got to a point where I felt like, whoa, this is taking me out of it. I need to, like, stop and figure out what is happening. Right. Um, but yeah, no, uh, it, it was the kind of thing where in the moment, yeah, I was overwhelmed, but then... As time went on, I much better understood it, and I'm like, okay, okay, I get this, I get this. No, for sure. I, no, I get that. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say once again with Glimmer and Nicole, uh, I wish their roles were a bit more expensive than they actually were. Mm -hmm. Um, once again, I didn't hate them at all. Like I liked them as characters, but I felt that their role in the grand scheme of things wasn't important. No, not really. It, it, it they felt like they were there because they had to be. Um, yeah. Actually, no. You you know who was actually there because they had to be, Panacea and Linka. I forgot <laughs> they existed. And then they would show up in cutscenes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like if you didn't check your like menus regularly. You would you would be able to forget they were there. Mm -hmm. I remembered Riku because like was with it constantly us. says in your menu they there are guests in your party and I'm like wait where are they exactly? <laughs> it, it I think the the really crazy thing to me is that there are multiple cutscenes in which I would like I was watching we we're in the middle of some fight and then in the cutscene it's like oh there they are with their weapons and I was like. What even are their weapons? I never realized what they were. And then it's like, oh, mm. Linka has, like, a staff? But it's more akin to, like, a yes. Melia or a um, Amelia Glimmer type staff. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. like, yeah. why does she have that? Why does she have that? So, so no, there, there were just... Those two in particular, I think, are actually probably 
the weakest characters in this entire story because they are there only because they have to be. Nicole and Glimmer, at the very least, the first half of the story, they felt very important and they felt explore like they were being explored. They just kind of dropped off in the latter half. Um, these two felt right, completely yeah. underutilized. Yeah, and they do get like a new leash of life towards the end of the DLC, but it felt that felt also kind of out of nowhere. Where I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, that was a deal, wasn't it? They only had like so much time left until their homecoming. I completely forgot about that side of it. <laughs> yeah, well, it, at least they explain how they broke out of the system. At least they explained that, because that was also That's, a question yeah. people had left over from the um, from the base game. Because like ev everyone who's played 3, at least to Chapter 5, kind of predicted that this is the DLC was going to be about the founders of the city. Um, but yes. like reading about the statues and reading about the founders, it was like, these two were soldiers, but then they lived to be 80. How did they do that? How did they how did they break out of that? And it's like, okay. Oh, for sure. Okay, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they they explain that. But that's kind of all they do with them in the latter half of the game. Yeah. I mean there's some night once again, I touched upon it a little bit. There are some nights scene between Rex and Glimmer, not so much Nicole and Schultz. There's a few of them in there. Um, there's a few of them in there. Yeah, we, yeah, which which do give like some nice back and forth. Um, but Rex re really keeps that to himself why he's doing it. And I, I wish they would have let loose there maybe just a tiny bit. So one one thing I'll um, one thing I'll say right now, I still haven't done all of the side stuff. Um but what what side uh -huh. stuff I have done, um there are like important pieces of lore and plot points that are in there. Mainly anything involving Riku. Yes. Um, some of the biggest revelations came from side stuff with Riku. Um, so I, I yes. don't know. There, there. It's probably going to be something where like, oh, you get more care, you get more moments with Shulk and uh, Nickel, and then Panacea and Linka get more to do in the side stuff. I just haven't done that yet. Hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm I've done about. 80% of it. Like, I've not done everything, but a good chunk of it. And I just feel like for the... Like, between, like, beyond, like, the main cast, I feel that Rex and Glimmer get the most, like, interaction mm -hmm. time. But that's just me. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, then we go to, to Rex and Shulk. And I... um was actually very happy with how they were portrayed, like how literally the end of their story basically came together. I agree. Uh, because they because they, they initially started with like getting introduced in the story and not really revealing too much about themselves. But then like immediately they're going into basically what happened to their worlds, what what the Trinity processor how that went awry a little bit and how Everything has basically come together in this weird ball of destruction. Um, and then let her have, like, there is so much... I feel a lot more focus on them and what they're up against that it becomes, like, very intriguing what would actually happen. Um, and then the last bit, uh, I felt very strongly about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I thought they were handled very well. I think... Overall, in the story, it felt like Shulk had a little more to do than Rex, but for the most part, they felt pretty balanced. I also yeah. thought their interactions with each other were great. I love the scene where Rex is like, Shulk, I don't know how to be a dad. I don't know what to do. And then <laughs> Shulk is just like, hey, man, here's my advice. I thought that was great because it really it played into both of their characterizations oh, yeah. perfectly. Yes. Yes, 100%. Mm -hmm. No, it was, it was. They, they were great. To talk beyond like the character stuff, I would say that the world was a bit more. I mean, the world of Torna was also somewhere between expensive and like compact. I think I would say the same about Future Redeemed. To be honest, like it, it still feels vast with its five different areas, but there, there is still like 
a compact factor in place where you can e easily overbridge it or find ways to come across it very quickly or do stuff that you need to do. It's not that hard to, to traverse. I agree. I think... So thinking back on Torna, Torna was expansive but compact. It, it, the way it was done is it was kind of like one big rectangle. It was more like one big yes. rectangle. Not counting Gormot. Gormot's this, you know, weird leftover thing from the base game. But Torna itself mm -hmm. was like a rectangle. Um, this is more like a really a long, long hallway with a bunch of stuff overlapping where yeah. overall you can look at the map and you can see things like, oh, this is just a straightforward line, but there's so much in that line. It's not it's not yeah. a square or a rectangle like with Torna, but it's so much longer. It feels like it takes up the same mm -hmm. amount of space. It's just over a longer period. Now, how I would describe it is where Torna was a triangle. This is more like a long oval. I can agree with that. I can agree with that. Yeah. Uh, and there are different ways of doing it. And I don't think, like, the oval shape, like, really, like, irritates or does stuff, like, lesser than Torna. It's just a different way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. One thing I will say I um, loved about Future mm -hmm. Redeemed is this is the first time since Xenoblade X that we have had one interconnected world with no loading screens. You can go from the beginning to the end yeah. without a single loading screen, and I love that. Yeah, it's it, it, honestly, it was pretty connected. I think Torna was in great ways too, but there were still sections where I would load in and out, especially if you would go to Goma. Mm -hmm. um, but here it was completely connected, which was nice. It was really nice. I think if you would tr quick trans uh, transport to somewhere by using the map, it would still load in a little bit. Yes. Uh, yes. But it was never that big of a concern where I'm like, I would prefer rocking because that would still take longer, to be fair. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think overall, like, like, just this level design was so... The level design, the world design was just so dang immaculate. It took a lot of the best stuff from the base game and just hyper, like, made everything so much more focused. And mm. as a result, as opposed to having to make multiple different areas, they're able to make one area that was long, but also just so chock full of, like, detail and secrets and things to do. But at no point did it ever feel like there was. There was, you know, padding. It never did the, the the community feature in Torna where all the community did all the community existed exclusively just to wall off progression. It never really did that here. Yes. There were points where it felt like there were level yeah. spikes or difficulty spikes rather. Um mm. which I think this might actually be the hardest Xenoblade game since the original for me. I can see that. Like, there was a, a point even in my live stream where I was kind of struggling with, like, a two and a half hour in enemy. And despite me executing stuff well, like, the enemy would, would attack relentlessly and I would have to pull back a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's... It is interesting. Because with Torna, like you said, the community feature was such a central point. Where here it feels more split up by collecting everything, not but not being the main focus. Like you can still go through the story and feel completely satisfied with it, but that's also only just half of the DLC. I think going for like tons of the collectibles, like the enemy encyclopedia, the the community feature, that is part of the charm of the DLC and seeing as much of the world as possible and seeing the context for what the world was back then. Mm -hmm. um, like it doesn't shove it all into your face you don't have to do it and don't have to interact with it if you don't want to where Torna with community you were forced to do that even though I didn't dislike it as many other people I thought it was actually similar to how I feel now it was a very novel way of cramming more interactions into the game 
uh, here it felt like a more natural part of the progression and you were invited to do it instead of making you be forced to do it. Yeah, I think that's the main difference is here it just feels so much more voluntary as opposed to a ma as opposed to mandatory. Oh, for sure. But in general like I still felt the same or acted the same way like I did in Torna. I would say in some ways though they really pulled back the curtain on community a little bit because basically it's mostly and for the most part, it's either finding the survivors and bringing them to Col Colony 9 and inter interact with them later. Or um, doing one quest, talk to them like two or three times and then getting the golden border around their character. It feels a lot more snappier in that sense. But it focuses a lot more on the interaction itself instead of doing a bunch of tasks and then getting it done. Mm -hmm. So there is... I think there's an argument to be made for it that community is definitely better now, despite like even regarding or disregarding the the requirement it was in Torna. I think that you are you get more value out of it now because it's more focusing on actual getting to know the world and what the world was like in this prequel, instead of basically doing getting more value of the game by doing tasks that you actually kind of don't want to do mm -hmm. so I, I once again i think there's an argument to be made there for sure honestly i feel like the way the community feature here is handled as well as just kind of all of the 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 side quests in general yeah uh i feel like that is something that it, it's just like a natural evolution of what of how base three did it which one of the reasons why i love base three side content is because mm. so much of it is focused on um the characters and the building up of the world um yes and it was the kind of thing where i had just as much fun doing side quests both the hero quests which were voiced as well as just the random like oh there there's no voice acting here it's just text um but it yeah. was the fact that like i loved seeing how this world developed um, whereas this is also kind of the opposite where it's more so like it's seeing how the world develops, but it's also seeing how the world once was Th this, uh -huh. the one thought I've had with this entire expansion is it feels very, it feels like the other side of the coin from the base game where the base game was so much about like, there is no real past and it's about building up the future. Um, and like, yes. and that kind of thing. Whereas this expansion feels like it's. There's a lot about the past and seeing how that affects now. Yeah, 100%. Outside of, like, the actual world and, like, the side quests that you do, which are actually quite fun in general, I don't think necessarily they feel like... I mean, there are basically fetch quests, but I think they provide context and why they are fetch quests and why they don't have the materials at hand with Colony 9, so I don't really mind them as much. It feels much more justified like, than a lot of the side quest in Xenoblade 1, where it was just collection quest 2, get this item. Yes. And yeah. that was it. And But but like a good chunk of it, of, of a course, and we kind of touched upon it earlier, is of course the battle system. Um, what did you feel did the battle system, like, maybe did better in the DLC than maybe base game? I think the combat system feels a lot more again with everything else in this expansion it feels a lot more focused um and as a result mm. like like the base game has all the different jobs the different classes um and as yes. a result there were some jobs and classes that were underwhelming some that were way better than others um certain arts that felt like this is such like this is just kind of useless whereas this because there are only the six classes um Hmm. It feels so much more like, oh, you can do basically, uh, it, it, it's everything here. I don't think there's anything bad here. No one feels like this is a useless character or a useless class. There are ones that are broken that are clearly much less balanced that are like, this is too powerful, Rex. Um, but 
it never feels like anyone is like, this character is just kind of the weak link. It, we never have a Sharla situation where this character is just kind of useless. No. Um, so it feels like everything that's happening here feels so much more balanced, but I, it's because it's so much smaller and so much more focused. It allows them to yes. put a lot more effort and polish into making this the best it could possibly be. I also found it kind of funny that everything was unlocked basically through kits that you would find in an environment. Yes, yes. There were a number of points where I was like, this boss is really hard. I should probably go find a kit. And then I would spend, <laughs> uh, honestly, not even that long finding a kit. And then I'd come back and I would just do it. Yeah, I, I think that of all the side stuff that you need to do, it's likely finding the kits. The, the, and there's not a good guide for you to basically go find all the kits right now, so you basically have to go on good luck or good authority where to find some of the kits. I'm working on that. I'm um, working on that right now. Oh, you're working on that? Very mm -hmm. good. Very good. Um, but it's... I wouldn't say, like... Not everything is essential. Like, accessories, you can take it or leave it. But, for example, the gems, which, once again, return from free... Or, say, um, getting enough of the materials to unlock all of the arts and arts upgrades. That stuff is super crucial in this DLC. Because, especially if you get to the latter half of the game, some of the enemies become really brutal and difficult and really can strike you down with, with vengeance, even when you the least expect it. That, um, the, last two, the last two bosses were so difficult and i'm seeing a number of people online also struggle with them i actually thought the, the the penultimate boss was harder than the final boss um oh interesting okay yeah no i i, I had more trouble with the penultimate fight than the actual fight the, or the actual final fight huh it makes sense mm -hmm. sure but yeah it's 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 a lot of build up and uh the build-up requires you to basically go out and do some of the side stuff. Once again, it's not a requirement, and if you are confident enough, you can obviously skim over some of it. But it's kind of recommended that you do. Yeah. For example, like, find an Aether Mast, a mast, a mast, unlock all the points on the map, and trying to find those points on the map is super crucial to get stuff done in this DLC. Mm-hmm. No, it, it feels like this is probably the the best Xeno Xenoblade game with the best synergy between the main story and the side content, where it feels like it wants it, it is it wants you to do both, but it never feels like it's forcing you to do both. Um, mm. And then it also doesn't make it hard to do both. There again, I was able to like, oh, I should probably go get like an affinity unlock kit. So I can, you know, put it on one of the characters. Uh, and then I would spend maybe 20 minutes, if that. And then I would have it. And then I would just go back, unlock a bunch of stuff. And then I would do it. So it, it, it never yeah. feels too difficult. It never feels too difficult. But it also just feels so natural of like, yeah, just go, go do some stuff and come back. Not a big deal. Even with that, I would recommend players not. You don't have to go once again for one hundred percent, but I would say do go at, at least do some stuff when you get into the latter half of the game because it's so crucial. You need Absolutely. to get some of the unlock kits, whether it be the affinity, the art unlocks, uh, and then the, the gems. The accessories are kind of whatever, but the those first three yeah. are are kind of you should really go get them for sure. And also get the materials for the gems, obviously, because gems, like, get you a bunch of upgrades that you'd likely necessarily need. And if you played base free, then you kind of know what we're talking about. But, like, there are so many of the gems that you kind of need to get your stats just right, because, like, the stats of the characters are a bit over the place, and some are more st um, stronger than others. Rex. Um, I mean, they you have basically have... The three main classes, so attacking, defending, um, and healing, like, two times. And so even then, the stats are slightly different between each character. So taking advantage of those unlocks can be very cru crucial by the end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've also, uh, I've seen people who have, like, gone in and, you know, done a lot, done a lot, basically unlocked everything, 
and I've been seeing what they're able to do. And like, I saw someone who got a, what was it? It was like 700, 730 something percent in the chain attack. Like in oh a single, in a single go, like in a single go around, not even like hmm. total, but like, like a single, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the term, but like they picked Noah or something and they were able to get it, get it up to like 700%. Like that is insane. How did you do that? And it's like, it, it's hmm. so easy to, so easy. I actually don't know, but apparently it is totally possible to seriously just break things. Yeah, that's what I'm currently wanting to do. I'm currently going for all the 100% and all the collectibles, and I kind of want to see what characters look like by the end of it. Um, but I don't know, I just think it would be funny. <laughs> I don't know. I just I just think it would be interesting to do. I don't know, I guess. <laughs> Before we go, I've been, we've been talking for quite a while, and I think we touched upon all major points. I think for the last five to ten minutes we're gonna talk about a bit more spoilery so if you don't want to listen to that i we appreciate you coming along and we very much appreciate you but if you don't want to know like any particular specifics about stuff that's going to happen um maybe this is the point for you to maybe jump off yeah we've like, been it, vague it, up it, to I this point we'll not say yeah I wouldn't say that that that's, that this this discussion have been completely a void of spoilers in some regard, but we're gonna get heavy into it now. So mm -hmm. you know, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. <laughs> have a nice day. Go drink some water. All right, that, are they gone now? I uh, don't. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. All right. You've you've been warned. It's their fault. At okay. This can point. we talk about the opening of chapter five? <laughs> Oh my god, <laughs> that is that made me scream because that is like we see what Earth looked like before Klaus's experiment. That was huge. Not only that, but the freaking radio. The radio yeah. was referencing every single other Xeno thing in this entire series. Xeno Saga, Xenoblade yes. X, and even a little nod to Xeno Gears. That made me freak out. Yeah, I was, so what was happening is that I watched that scene two times. Obviously, the first time I, I experienced it throughout the game, and the second time I watched it for the in-game event theater. Mm -hmm. um, so the first time I was focusing on the scene itself, and I was kind of freaking out from, oh my god, this is Klaus's world. Oh my god. And then I was just looking around with the, with the right stick, just looking at the houses, and then slowly walking to that vista. I'm like... Goodness me, and then the entire scene with Niel and everything that goes down there, it's so cool. I loved, I, um, I really loved, uh, just from like a, like, kind of like a filmmaking aspect, I loved how the, the, the way that scene where she's trying to explain to Matthew, like, yo, like, check out this world, it's so great, it's beautiful, like, it's perfect, and then, uh, her trying to tell Matthew what this world is like is drowning out the radio talking about human rights violations, Yes. And it's yes. like, I love that from like a filmmaking, like a narrative sort of thing. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. Then the second time I mostly focused because I noticed it the first time what I wasn't really focusing on. Then I focused on like the dialogue of the radio. Mm -hmm. And I was going wild because I played most of the Xeno games at some point. I wouldn't say I remember them all from the top of my head, but it was mostly like cliff notes and key points, right? Um, so I was I was listening to it and hearing and reading what they were saying and I was like, this feels like the end game. This feels like that conclusion that at some points we really wanted to have. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just completely like going insane. And once again, usually super reserved with this stuff, but it was the first time where I feel like they knew what we wanted and we immediately got what we wanted out of it. Absolutely, absolutely. I also, I, I really, I really loved how N was used in this entire ending sequence. I already liked N from the base game, but I know a lot of people didn't. Mm. They felt he was a little too one note. Um, but this, I'm seeing a lot of people turn around on him because it gives him so much more depth. You see how he's like, oh yeah, he's like. <laughs> Obviously, he was already, like, lying to himself about all of this because he's just so obsessed with, like, I don't want to lose my wife. I don't want to lose her. But he's kind of, like, he's just miserable, but he's lying to himself. 
Uh, I loved yeah, how there's N... two po- there's two points outside. Yeah, there's two points with N that really hit home to me. The first of all was the flashback scene where uh, M comes into the picture at the very end of it. That was also one of the cliff notes. I was like, holy snap! Oh, absolutely. And then the second one was that glimmer, basically comments from, hey, there's no spark in his eyes. Uh, yes. You know, something else, speaking of the eyes, um, something someone pointed out, I don't remember who, I just saw it online last night, but um, Glimmer notes that, like, there is no light behind his eyes, it's just dead. Um, Yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. Shortly afterwards, once you go into, you know, once you get into Chapter 5, Niall, when she's going, like, that nice man with the silver hair and, and the kind eyes... And then once you actually see Alpha, Alvis, I'm still getting used to that. Once you actually see him, there's nothing behind his eyes. The exact same way as N. I thought yeah. that was great. Yeah. Once again, because A is basically the conscience of Alpha. So they are separated. So we don't know, we don't even know what Niall means at that point. It, it feels strange. Mm-hmm. It's just gone. Um, He's just soulless. He's just like... This world is messed up. I don't have faith in you people. I want to start over again. Another thing, I really like that, um, you know, Al- Alvis Alpha is the villain, but it still makes sense with how they were in Xenoblade 1. It doesn't feel like they're doing a disservice to how he was portrayed in the first game. No. It feels no. like he was very much like, this is, this is how... Alvis was in Xenoblade One. The only difference is he had faith in humanity. Hmm. It, it does. It does feel like he is slightly disconnected from what he was in One. But obviously, because the separation with A, that also makes a whole lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do. I do think that everything has a reason behind it. And that specific chapter, and it makes total sense. What I love about that chapter the most, though. Is that after? I don't know if I remember if it was Rex or Shulk. I should probably watch that scene again, uh, where they say from this is a fake world, to basically to Nile, mm-hmm. and then everything turns dark and like rotten as it as you can kind of see it at later points throughout the series. I think that was I'm a like that said oh, that. Hmm? I'm not sure. Sorry. I think that was yeah. A that said this is a fake world. Oh, that's a- oh A was it? I okay, think so. Fair enough. I think so. Yeah. I, I don't remember fully 100%, but when that happens and everything turns dark and, like, rotten, I'm like, oh my god, this this is perfect. This is chef's kiss. <laughs> oh, ab- absolutely. It's also just kind of... Again, I, I going back to how this is kind of the other side of the coin from the base game. The base game was all about how, like, you know... the It's about, like, the fear of the future and how, like you're not even living in the past you're just living in the now because you're so scared to move on and for things to end and to have that yes. pain and all of that that like that already resonated with me that like Xenoblade 3 made me cry because I, I love that so much but then this mm. it's the other side where it's all about the future and it's about the hatred of the past and wanting to ignore what's happening in the moment because it's not pleasant. You want to lie to yourself and just ignore all of that. Hence, again, the radio, uh, how she's just completely ignoring it and drowning it out. Um, I just, I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was just such brilliant juxtaposition. And it works entirely with echoing what would eventually happen, you know, in the base game. Yes. But, but yeah, a lot of those um, flashbacks seen in the last two chapters with how Nail basically merged with Alpha and how that all came to be. Like, it made me, like, constantly, like, pay attention to every single detail. Um, I, I think that the ending two chapters, like, did so much to confidence on how good this series is. Mm-hmm. I, I am so over the moon with every decision in the story sense that they really made. Mm-hmm. I absolutely agree. Some of the execution might have been a little wonky at points, but what is here is great. I loved it. What did you th- what What did you think about the whole? And this might be like one of the scenes you uh, thought what went a bit fast. What do you think of made of the sacrifice of uh, Rex and uh, Shulk by the end of things? 
I liked it. I liked it. That felt like a very natural conclusion uh, to their characters. The whole idea that, you know, the, 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 the core processors, the Trinity processors are essentially powering, uh, powering origin. And now that, now that Ontos is gone, there needs to be, the Ontos is gone. And then, you know, uh, Numa is in the gauntlets, which I was like, what, <laughs> what the, what? Um, and then it's, yeah, yeah. it's implied that Logos is in uh, N-Sword. Um, it's like, okay, well, now there's just nothing powering it. So what what do we do to replace them? We take half of Antos and then the two administrators of previous, of, uh, of the Trinity processors, and they replace them. And it felt very, nat- it felt very natural. It's like they, they would do this. But it also makes sense that yeah. they would be the ones to do this. No one else could have done that. It was also a lovely conclusion. And then with the scene following where Matthew steps out of the, the new city and goes off on his own. Um, and then proclaims his full name. And then ending the entire game. That was, once again, like the exclamation point. It was not an additional factor. It was like the ending point where you're like... Oh, this all makes sense. <laughs> mm-hmm. I really liked the post credits um, where we see the two Earth, we see the two Earths or the two planets. I'm not even. I guess they're Earths. Um, they uh, they start to, to say separate again, and then eventually yeah. they merge back together into one. Um, I thought that was a very very nice capstone that also still worked within. Um, the context of how Xenoblade 3 ended, it didn't feel like any kind of retcon because mm. the base game also implied that they would merge back together again. Um, at some point, it's just not now. Um, and then, then yeah, no, I just, I thought that was a, I thought that was like just a really nice way to end it all. And it's like, oh, right, we're done. We're done here. That's the full story I of think we'll- Klaus. I think we'll get into this in a, in a maybe a later full length discussion, but I'm going to end with this question: Where do we go from here? Either, either we go back to X. I would want them to go back to X because I still want to know what's up with this planet. Oh yes, please. I want to know what's yeah, up with this planet. Yes, please. But also, Th- that, that memory bank, that memory bank scene still leaves me confused, and we never had a follow up on that. I'm like, hmm, you know. Hey, hey, man, hey, man. It's something about this planet. That that yeah, it's something about <laughs> any questions you have. It's something about this planet. It's been eight years. Something about this planet. That's not an answer. <laughs> That's not an answer. No 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 no. It's something about this planet. Deal with it. That's what you got for eight years. Actually, I think it's the eight. Today is the eighth anniversary of the Japanese release. I think. <sighs> yeah. It's been exactly eight years. Anyway, mm. I would want them to go back to X, but. There are some other things. There's some other potential ways they can go with this, particularly because of that radio and uh, that little blue light towards the end. Um, I don't know. For sure. We'll uh, we'll probably talk about that at a later point, but there's a couple of ways they could go with this. Yeah, I think we covered most of it. Like there are obviously other factors we could like zoom into, but in grand scheme of things, I think we covered future redeemed honestly pretty well here i agree um any other things that you want to touch upon before we actually leave um so my friend when i beat it last night i messaged him and i was like hey i i I beat the game i beat the dlc and he was like no spoilers do you think they will ever sell this physically and he's been holding off Mm. On, on it because he wants yeah. to get it physically. I do not think they will ever yes. sell it physically because if they did, that means someone could start with this and this is the worst possible place to start. Oh, for sure. The- and I, I I agree with that. With Torna, it was more of a stepping stone and you could play them out of order. Torna, you could totally play uh, on its if- own and you, you might be confused on like yes. one or two things, but you could play that on its own and you would be fine. Yes. Yeah. I don't think that's the case here, to no. be honest. No. This game expects I, you to I don't have played think, yeah. every single Maybe, maybe you can game. get them in a package deal, like how they did it with, recently with Pokemon uh, 
a sword and shield where you would get both together in one cartridge. That's totally possible. Maybe that's an idea. They could do that. But I don't think they would. They are selling it separately at all. No. No, that this this one does not feel possible. Alrighty, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining on this long journey with us. Hope you enjoyed it. I sure did, and I'm sure Maka did too. I did. It feels so weird that this 10-year-long journey of my life is now essentially narratively over. The series will still to go. To me, it's a little bit longer because Europe actually got the initial release in English. That's true. That is true. I guess I should, I should, fix, I should say that uh, 10 years for me. 10 years for me. And even yeah. then, I don't think it was actually yeah. 10 years. I think it's more like 11. How weird we've come from Project Rainfall, huh? I... How weird is that? I, I got into Project Rainfall because I wanted to play the last story. And then I was <laughs> like, I'm going to buy Xenoblade because I want to support Project Rainfall. And man, uh -huh. I love Last Story. I love it. Yeah. I did not think Xenoblade would be my favorite of those three. I, I I do think Xenoblade was my favorite of those three. I think it was the... Maybe it was the first one that's released in Europe, too. Now that I think about it. I think it was the same here. I think with Club Nintendo in Europe, because those three games came out in within the same six to eight months, they released a Club Nintendo reward where we would get coins of all the free games in a nice case. Why is it anytime I hear about Club Nintendo Europe getting something, it's always something that I'm upset that we in America didn't get? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, last story I enjoyed too. I think that Pandora's Tower is a bit of an underrated gem because I do think the story is really cool. I'll be honest, but like, I, the gameplay is not everybody's thing. I still haven't played Pandora's Tower. It, it's It's... I just straight up like I have it. I just never got around to playing it. I need to do. I it's need to a fix very that. intense story. It's a very intense. Uh, that's a the discussion for another time. Maybe we'll do a retrospective on that on that period of time. That would yeah, be yeah, fun. yeah, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. We keep talking. Uh, Let's go. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time and keep it locked to Gaming Explained for more on Xenoblade and other things gaming as well. See you later. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>